gentlemen, uh, welcome to the highlight of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time we've all been waiting for patiently, and uh, the moment is here, and uh, I can see all fitting your seats uh, waiting for, uh, for you to begin. So I'm going to be brief and let uh, our panelists uh, uh, do most of the talking. Uh, what I'm going to talk about this morning is the structure of the Constitution. Uh, not individual provisions, uh, not uh, a myopic look at one part of the Constitution at a time, but the, the question of how does the Constitution work as a document, please Bill of Rights uh, work in the document, how uh, does an interpretation of a particular provision of the Constitution uh, bear on uh, not simply uh, that particular provision, but upon the way the document uh, works as a whole. Uh, the the uh, centerpiece uh, of, of the discussion, uh, if I may uh, turn this session, will be Professor Amar's paper, uh, which is forthcoming in the, uh, I think in the next issue of the Law Journal. And uh, I've been asked to read a note here. Uh, yes, please. Uh, and it will cause all of you to go out and buy a lifetime subscription in the journal. This is also on my, uh, my uh, now says on my, my future law clerk, who's uh, an editor. Yeah, it is indeed uh, an excellent piece of work, a yeah, very thoughtful piece of work. Uh, it is uh, uh, the kind of legal scholarship that. Uh, it goes precisely to the heart of what the federal society uh, is meant to do and was meant to, what, what established to do. Uh, I wrote a, an article some years back uh, complaining about uh, the, the phrase uh, that Justice uh, Marshall used, Chief Justice Marshall used, uh, it is a constitutionalized family. And uh, my complaint was that the phrase has been used uh, to interpret the Constitution in a way different from other documents. I had kind of an excuse to squint and rather looking at uh, the words of the Constitution or the structure to uh, treat it in a different, more uh, distant way. And uh, my, my complaint there was that uh, you then lose the philosophy of the document itself. It makes it very easy uh, to, uh, to then uh, 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 just quite enough uh, to read not what's the famous particular the, the document, but what uh, back to going on the judges uh, on the head. Um, we're going to uh, uh, put the last paper and the commentaries to it and uh, uh, put the land money's uh, comments, uh, which are on a uh, somewhat different topic that are related to this, this uh, subject matter. Uh, we'll, uh, Get away from that type of constitutional education. Uh, uh, I am uh, going to simply uh, say we have a distinguished panel. We have the most distinguished panel here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they are so distinguished that uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, bore you uh, with uh, reading their lengthy biographies. Folks put together a conference and put together biographies with all the materials. I encourage you to read those and put it into memory. I would note that we are very heavily uh, uh, influenced by Yale. Uh, Chris Armand uh, went here, both an undergraduate from law school, as a professor here. Professor uh, Smith uh, teaches here, Professor Langman teaches here. And I have a son in Yale, so. <laughs> Uh, the worst part here was. Uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to lead off uh, with, with Professor Amar uh, giving us uh, uh, a discussion uh, or a synopsis of his paper. I do want to encourage uh, all of you here to uh, at least buy the one copy of the year or at least photo scan it somewhere. <laughs> uh, it is a remarkable piece of legal scholarship. Uh, I read a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, stuff, uh, uh, legal scholarship and otherwise, and uh, I, I, I can tell you this is a remarkable piece of work. It will, it will, it will uh, uh, give us a lot of people today, and I know that for, for 
years and years to come. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Federal Society for uh, putting the panel together and putting that paper and inviting you. It's always a pleasure to speak with you um, and uh, to be on these panels, especially because so many other interesting uh, people are brought together and we don't always agree. Um, and uh, I find that I learn a lot more uh, when, when that happens than when all like minded folks uh, are brought together. Uh, let me try to explain, if, if I might, in, in the time that I have, um, what I mean by the, the title of this paper, uh, The Bill of Rights as a Constitution. Um, Professor Burns um, wrote a very thoughtful uh, essay called The Constitution as a Bill of Rights uh, some years ago. And he was picking up <coughs> the phrase of uh, Hamilton's in the Federalist number 84. Which Hamilton argued that the Constitution was, um, for every important purpose itself, a Bill of Rights. What Hamilton meant by that, I think, is that the structure of government uh, played a very important role in protecting uh, freedom um, and protecting against uh, government tyranny. Uh, and that although the Constitution doesn't have lots and lots of thou shalt not provisions, has some Article 1, Section 9, restricting Congress, and Article 1, Section 10, restricting the states. Um, uh, it's, its main emphasis, um, as anyone who just passingly looks at the document, uh, is on uh, more self consciously structural issues like uh, federalism, separation of powers, bicameralism, representation, uh, and, and uh, constitutional amendment. Uh, and Hamilton is arguing that through these devices, liberty uh, would be uh, protected and government held in check. Um, Hamilton also argued in the Federalist Number 84 that the preamble was profoundly important, that most of the important rights of the people were retained simply by the, the language of the preamble and the philosophy it represented. Uh, we, the people of the United States, do what they can establish. This Constitution. What he meant by that is that here we have a document emanating from a popular sovereign, uh, and that and, and, uh, popular sovereignty, or what uh, Lena Braille would probably call just uh, democracy or uh, majoritarianism, uh, is uh, an important uh, device uh, for securing liberty, especially the public liberty of democratic and collective self government. So, what I'd like to suggest today is that. Um, if you look carefully at the Bill of Rights, we'll actually see it as being much less discontinuous with the original Constitution than most of us have been led to believe. Most of us tend to think the conventional reading is the Bill of Rights is fundamentally paradigmatically not about structure, not about things like federalism, bicameralism, representation, constitutional amendment. Most of us also think that the Bill of Rights is not about majoritarianism. Self consciously counter majoritarianism, it's about individual rights, it's about majority rights. I think that's wrong. Uh, I think the essence of the Bill of Rights and the essence of the Constitution are profoundly populist, democratic, uh, majoritarian, um, and structural. Uh, let me try to get at that two ways. Um, one, let me um, remind you. Uh, that uh, Charles Beard and others, uh, notwithstanding, um, those who adopted our Constitution were revolutionaries. They saw themselves as revolutionaries. For, 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 in their own era, um, they were radical Democrats. Um, it is true that they were profound exclusion from the perspective of 1991, women, slaves, etc. But from the perspective of 1787, the process by which the Constitution became the supreme law of the land was more fundamentally participatory um, and democratic than anything that had ever proceeded in the history of the planet. Uh, previously, um, uh, uh, societies had been chartered by individual great men lawgivers claiming to be pipeline to God, Moses on Sinai. Solon, Lycurgus, um, 
even in the American experience, the predecessors to the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, were never adopted by the people of the states. Uh, none of the state constitutions were except for New Hampshire and Massachusetts in 1784 and 1780, respectively. So the pre existing state constitutions had to involve the populace of the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution did. Look at the most important, the constitutive part of the original Constitution. Um, that Article 7 says, by a simple majority vote, and especially convened convention, the people of Virginia could make this Constitution their supreme uh, law. And so we, when you look at the preamble, that we, the people of the United States, which sounds so populist, or Article 7, the last article of the original Constitution, its essence, I would argue, is fundamentally a, a participatory, democratic, majoritarian, at the most important level, which is the level of who gets to make the Constitution, and therefore who can unmake it. Ordinary day-to-day -day governance, of course, is a little bit more uh, detached from the people. Indirect election, uh, 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 a filtered uh, presidency, uh, um, a judiciary that's uh, still more enslaved. But for the process of constitutional creation, Article 7, extraordinarily majoritarian and democratic. And so I've argued that previous Federalist Society meeting, um, the process of constitutional amendment is um, similarly uh, majoritarian. I don't believe that Article 5 is the exclusive mechanism by which the Constitution can be amended. I think the people retain, and here I'm using the phrase the people to mean that collective popular sovereign retain an unalterable inalienable, indefeasible right to alter and abolish their government by simple majority votes, especially in convenient conventions. That's how the Constitution was adopted in 1787, state constitutions notwithstanding, um, and that's how it can be amended. What I want to argue is the Bill of Rights is consistent with that vision. That phrase, the people, appears twice in the original Constitution, the preamble, and in Article 1, talking about the people voting um, for uh, Congress. There is no phrase that appears more often uh, original Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the phrase the people, and they mean it collectively. They mean it in its paradigm, in its core, its essence, to be about popular sovereignty. It's there in the first, the right of people to assemble, petition. It's there in the second, the right of people to keep at bare arms. It's there in the fourth, it's there in the ninth, it's there in the tenth. Uh, and in every case, we understand that the echoing of that popular sovereignty motif um, of the original Constitution. Uh, let me very briefly, in the time that I have left, uh, try to suggest a very different reading from the clause of the various clauses of the Bill of Rights that you probably um, uh, heard in law school. Uh, and, uh, and I think each one of these may sound a little odd to you, uh, but I think when you put them together, it's not very odd to you. Uh, but I mean, in, a, in a way whose, I think, overall kind of consistency and harmony uh, suggests uh, that. Uh, the, the original Bill of Rights was rather different from the way we imagined it. Let me, uh, before I do that, say one final thing. We may today have a Bill of Rights that is appropriate and that we deserve, a very different one from the one that was created 200 years ago. But I would suggest, in large part, if that's so, if the transformation of the Bill of Rights has been legitimate on interpreted this ground, for those who want to take seriously the document as a whole, it is only because the Bill of Rights is profoundly changed when it gets incorporated against the states via the 14th Amendment. So the debate really will turn on whether the 14th Amendment was um, appropriately uh, about incorporating the Bill of Rights against the states. And if that case can be made, um, uh, there's a big debate there, and I don't want to enter it here, um, then the essence of the Bill of Rights becomes very different because the Reconstruction is about protecting minorities, it's about protecting uh, in a, a, a counter majoritarian rights in a way that the original Constitution, um, I, I argue, uh, was not. Uh, very briefly, um, there are 12 original amendments that are proposed by the First Congress. <coughs> Only the last 10 are ratified. So the thing that we call the First Amendment wasn't the First Amendment. Uh, the original First Amendment actually had to do with government size. It said Congress needs to be bigger than it. Uh, there has to be a, a secure minimum size of Congress going beyond what Article 1 provides. That is, in its essence, a structural provision about representation. And the idea is that liberty will best be protected if you have a government that's much more representative of the people. That's a majoritarian provision, in essence. The concern was, because Congress was 
so small, um, it would be unrepresented with people, only a few great elite men um, would get into office, and they wouldn't have a sense of fellow feeling and sympathy with ordinary constituents. Um, so the original First Amendment was designed to cure that, to bring people up, to tighten the link between Congress and uh, their constituents. A majoritarian a kind of amendment, an amendment about structure and representation. Um, another way to put my global theme, um, before I talk about the original Second Amendment, is, well, I'll talk about the original Second Amendment. Second Amendment was about Congress not being able to vote itself a pay increase. <laughs> it sounds like they had an interesting election. Once again, concerns about structure of government, about government self dealing, about the possibility of an unrepresentative government. That's a majoritarian provision, too. Uh, uh, here's the other way of putting the point. Let's recall Federalist Number 51. Madison says there are two basic issues in government. One is protecting um, uh, citizens uh, generally against an unrepresentative government. Uh, uh, but in a corporation, if you set up a board of directors and managers, maybe they'll try to run the corporation or the company in their own interest and not in the interest of the shareholders. That's the first problem, of making sure that the folks in government aren't just sort of doing things for their, their own benefit. The second issue, Madison says, is protecting a minority from a majority of fellow citizens. So like protecting a minority of shareholders from a majority of shareholders. What I want to argue is that the original Bill of Rights was much more about the first issue, what economists would call the agency problem of government, than it was about the, the second issue. It's much more about protecting the majority of citizens from possibly unrepresentative, elitist governments. We see that in the original First Amendment, which comes within one state of being adopted. Uh, only Delaware uh, votes against it. And Delaware votes against it because Delaware likes a small Congress because Delaware gets a bigger proportion share in a smaller Congress. Um, so 10 of the states ratify it, one doesn't. The other, uh, the last 10 members were just ratified by 11, so that's the only difference between why the last 10 get in and the original first uh, doesn't. The Second Amendment, the original Second Amendment, clearly that government self view. Let's take our First Amendment. Our First Amendment today is, is often understood as being about individual autonomy, self expression. Uh, personhood, um, and those perhaps are important things. I don't want to suggest that they're not there at all. But they're not the core, they're not the essence of paradigm. The original Bill of Rights is not even about protection, it's, it's about, as Alexander Michael John pointed out, it's about democracy, about representative government, and the need for constituents to be able to participate in that representative process, to voice their, their views. It's also about protecting a majority of people from a possibly unrepresentative government. The paradigmatic First Amendment rights holder is not Jehovah's Witnesses or communists or unpopular speakers. It's the Republican Party of 1800 that actually has a majority of the citizens and an unrepresented Congress is trying to suppress their speech. That's why, for example, these guys are trying to make their arguments uh, uh, that the Alien Sedition Acts are unconstitutional to a jury. A jury is a more populist body. A jury will protect popular speech criticizing government. And that's why there's this deep linkage between First Amendment and uh, free speech and jury trial with Zanger and the Alien Sedition Act. Today, because we think the, uh, the First Amendment is counter-majoritarian, we distrust juries and we try to get issues to judges rather than, than juries. The right of the people. And one final thing about the Alien Sedition Act, this is about government trying to keep itself in office. It's a crime to criticize an incumbent congressperson, um, but it's not a crime for the incumbent congressperson to criticize his challenger. Okay, this is about people in government entrenching themselves in office, the agency problem, the self-dealing problem of government. The original right of the people to assemble is about the right of the people to assemble in conventions to alter and abolish their government. Um, uh, the Second Amendment is in large part about protecting the right of revolution against an unrepresentative government and protecting against a federal standing army, which an unrepresentative government tried to use the army to suppress the majority of citizens and repress democracy. Um, so, too, with the Third Amendment, it's not so much about privacy, it's about controlling a federal government that's going to have the army and therefore be able to repress the majority of citizens. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is in large part about making sure that people whose houses are searched can get to a, a, an unrepresentative government, can 
can get to a jury. The key clause of the Fourth Amendment is that government searches and seizures have to be reasonable. Now, today, judges are deciding that 200 years ago, reasonableness was a question for the jury to decide. Once again, um, the idea was that local and populist institutions like juries would keep an unrepresented, possibly unrepresentative government in check. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, um, let's put aside the takings clause. I think that's a little bit more purely Madisonian in, in, its, in its nature. It's a little bit more of an individual rights uh, provision than the rest. Um, another way of seeing the point that the rest aren't is that they only apply against the federal government and not the states. A federal government is a government that actually is going to be less representative. Uh, but as Federalist 10 tells us, there's not going to be a majority tyranny problem with the federal government the way there, there is with the states. So the rest of the Fifth Amendment, due process means, in its core, in its essence, presented by good and lawful men. That's grand jury. Again, the right of people to participate in government uh, through, through jury trial, uh, which is much more populous uh, in, its, uh, in its essence. Um, double jeopardy is about protecting the integrity of an original uh, jury uh, verdict against being overturned. The jury is featured in three separate amendments, in the Fifth uh, Grand Jury, in the Sixth Criminal Jury, um, in the seventh civil jury, and it's not just about the litigants' rights to, uh, to, to, uh, to have the jury, it's about the people's rights to be on the jury, to participate in government. This is um, the jury as a democratic um, uh, public school, educating citizens in their rights and duties. Um, it, it connects to Frank Easterbrook's point about how the Constitution to really um, uh, make a difference has to be the lived experience and be integrated into the culture. And part of the way to do that is to have juries of, uh, in a Fourth Amendment context when uh, a government official breaks into your house without, um, with, with, without uh, good reason. You sue that person, you get to a jury that's a civil jury, it's a Seventh Amendment jury, but again, it's a jury that's keeping an eye on the government and constitutionality. Why do we have the Eighth Amendment, uh, cruel and unusual punishment and bail? It's in part because in sentencing and setting bail, judges are acting without juries and therefore are less to be trusted because these guys are permanent government officials. Just like people in the standing army are permanent government officials and less to be trusted. If you want a militia to check the populist and localist militia, to check a nationalist elitist standing army, populist and localist uh, jurors to check an elitist and, and more central, um, more nationalized uh, 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 Set of federal judges. The ninth and tenth amendments, uh, tenth is clearly about federalism in part, but when they talk about the rights of the people, they are paradigmatically not talking about things like individual privacy. That's John Stuart Mill, 1840, that's 14th Amendment, 1867, but in 1789, that's really not what the people is about, that's not what liberty is about. Um, they're talking about collective rights, paradigmatically like the right of the people to alter and abolish their government through these devices, like conventions, as I tried to argue uh, in our conference. That's pretty much sort of a, just a, a sweep through the Bill of Rights. I'll, I'll shut up now, there's, there's a lot more that I can't quite I'm going into, but I'm sure it'll be picked up by others. Federal 63 
says that the Constitution, the unwritten Constitution, is unique insofar as it excludes totally the people in their collective capacity from any share in the government. Professor Mars' thesis is then that the people kept out of the government by the unamended Constitution were brought back into the government by the Bill of Rights. But what people? When he says that, quote, the essence of the Bill of Rights was more structural than not and more majoritarian than common majoritarian, he has to be referring to local majorities on the whole, not national majorities. Sponsored by the anti federalists the Bill of Rights is intended to restore or to secure the rights of state and local majorities to protect local institutions that somehow promote, promote as he says, the educated and virtuous electorate. And he makes a persuasive case. The Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, for example, can be read to mean that Congress shall make no law respecting state establishments of religion, thereby protecting those state establishments. The Second Amendment, by securing the right of the people to bear arms as part of local militias, does indeed reflect the anti federalist sphere of national standing arms, like Tocqueville. Whom Professor Mark quotes at this point, the anti federalists did indeed emphasize the total importance of the jury and the significance of the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendments. And he was surely right when he says the Ninth Amendment should be seen not as a state of individual rights, but of the ultimate sovereignty of the people. Now, this point about the Ninth Amendment seems to me to deserve some elaboration, more than he gives it in his paper and more than he, of course, gave today. In fact, as he might have pointed out, the anti federalists were not completely satisfied with the Bill of Rights that came out of Congress. The Bill of Rights, as one of them, was no more than a pinch of snuff, a whipped syllabub. A North Carolina friend of mine told me, explained to me what it was. It's a kind of dessert. A whipped syllabub, frothy and full of wind, formed only to peach and power. Now, what was missing from the Bill of Rights as needs to be understood? Well, in his definitive study on um, the Constitution of the Bill of Rights, Professor Story, Herbert Story, to whom you refer, makes that absolutely clear. What was missing was present in, for example, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. For example, quoting from that Declaration of Rights, that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into the state of society, they cannot by any contact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Here's the declaration. Calling for a Bill of Rights during the Virginia ratification phase. Patrick Henry pointed to this provision especially. His colleague, Edmund Randolph, made the same point. What was missing in the Federal Bill of Rights as it came out of Congress was a perpetual standard around which the people might rally if or when the legislature should, have, should violate the rights of the limits of the cause. In other words, the Constitution should remind the people as the Virginia Constitution reminded the people of their ultimate sovereignty, of their right to hope to alter and abolish the government, which, in their judgment, had violated the trust bestowed on it. Or, as still another Virginia put it, to renew and give it a fresh spring at stated periods. These rights were stated at the head, the very head of the Virginia Constitution. So, why not, said one delegate? Why not the head of this general confederation? Those rights characterize the man, especially the true Republican, the citizen of this continent. Their enumeration of the head of the new constitution can inspire and conserve the affection for the native country. They will be the first lesson the young citizens becoming men to sustain the dignity of their being. Well, Madison and the Federalists generally did not disagree with the principle of this, Dr. Sarah. But as Soren demonstrates, Madison especially was determined that a statement of this sort not be given a prominent place in the Constitution. Quoting Story, 
The problem with the Bill of Rights as a perpetual standard or a set of maxims to which the people might rally is that it might tend to undermine stable and effective government. Precisely because he was, Madison was intent on establishing a government that would be stable and effective, he rejected the Virginia law. He rejected it because, as Stoney puts it, the Virginia Declaration of Rights asserted that free government depends on a frequent recurrence of the frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. And all that was doubting that. Hence, if my reading is correct, that perpetual standard or statement of first principles was not pressed before, it was consigned to the Ninth Amendment. There, but in a much less conspicuous place, and in language much more sober than Patrick Henry's, it serves to remind the people, or serves as a reminder to the people, that they are the source of the powers exercised by government. And insignificantly, but not insignificantly, the Ninth Amendment, among other things, was cited in more than one of the secession uh, assemblies, Virginia, for example, to secede from the, uh, from the United States. One of the things, one of the authorities they cited was that Ninth Amendment. They were here reasserting that sovereign principle. Now, my chief quarrel, I suppose someone in my position has to have some quarrel. <laughs> my chief quarrel with Professor Amar's thesis has to do with his association of Madison with this project of empowering local majorities as a means of checking the national government. No one worked harder than Madison to limit their capacity to do mischief. After all, in the Philadelphia Convention, Madison was the most persistent supporter of the so-called Council of Revision, which would have had the authority to veto state legislation on the political as well as constitutional problems. And in his letter of October 17, 1787, to Jefferson, who was in Paris at the time, uh, Madison explained his new constitution, he points to this one material defect of the absence of that strong uh, limitation in the Constitution on, on state legislation. He said the injustice of state laws has been so frequent and so flagrant as to affirm the most steadfast friends of the public, as to align the most steadfast friends of the republics. Now, I'm persuaded that the anti federalists sought a Bill of Rights as a means of empowering local majorities and thereby preventing the national government from misusing its powers. But for that purpose, Madison placed his hope elsewhere. You see, he put it at the end of the Federalist 10, in the extent and proper structure of the Union, we need to hold a Republican remedy for the disease that's most concerned to the Republican government. Now, Professor Amar cites a passage from Federalist 51, which you refer here, where Madison says, it is of great importance to make a public, not only to guard the society against the oppression of rulers, but to guard one part of the society against the injustice of the other part. Amar continues by saying that, saying that the conventional understanding of the Bill of Rights seems to focus almost exclusively on the second issue, protection of the only against the majority, while ignoring the first, protection of the people against selfish the government. What was first in the minds of those who framed the Bill of Rights, he says, was protecting the people from self-interested government. But it was not first in Madison's mind. And I think Professor Amar could discover this by focusing on or reading the kinds of attention to the passage that follows, or the sentences that follow the passage he quotes. The passage continues as follows. Tell us if you want. Different interests necessarily exist in different classes of citizens. If a majority is united by a common interest, the rights of the minority will be easily secure. There are about two methods of providing against the sea what people on talk about that. Well, what we're left with here is a traditional understanding of the, uh, the origin of the rights, the sponsor of the deed, the anti federalists, and not that it's consistent by James Madison, sponsored by the anti federalists on the fear that the new national government would misuse its powers. Professor Amar has given us the best account yet of the means by which they hope to start against that misuse. The fact is, of course, that after incorporation into the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights has been used primarily to protect individuals and minorities against local majorities, and that that takes nothing away from, uh, from his particular argument. It does, however, illustrate something. In fact, it demonstrates something. 
that Madison was justified in thinking that the original Constitution was effective in not providing a sufficient check on those local majorities. Thank you. such as a lottery or first come, first serve. 
while I try to view it throughout the year that the First Amendment is at the core of our liberties, I think there's a danger in placing the uh, press um, above the <coughs> people uh, as a, a mediating institution or otherwise. Another consequence of downplaying the individual rights motif of the Bill of Rights, and of course, an appeal does not read this out of the bill. But another danger is well illustrated by the exclusionary rule. Akil has uh, demonstrated by Justice White before him, I think, that the warrant clause is not at the core of the Fourth Amendment. That the uh, touchstone of the Fourth Amendment is the requirement that searches and seizures be reasonable. And with this much, I wholeheartedly agree. But Akil also seems attracted to the idea that because the Fourth Amendment has the term the people, the right of the people to be free from unreasonable procedures. This suggests that the Fourth Amendment right is a collective right. To be fair, Akil did not pursue this idea in this argument, but others have. Uh, Professor Anthony Amsterdam has made a point similar to Akil's, that the Fourth Amendment says the people, and is therefore about government structure, not about individual rights of affected persons. From this premise, he and others have sought to justify application of the exclusionary rule for Fourth Amendment violations, as well as relaxed standing requirements, for instance, to raise Fourth Amendment claims. <coughs> if, as I would contend, the Fourth Amendment is about individual rights, then the exclusionary rule is much more difficult to justify. Exclusion of probative evidence obtained by the police does nothing to address the individual's uh, rights that may have been violated. A judge uh, friendly explained in his lament about turning the Bill of Rights into a code of criminal procedure. The exclusionary rule merely gives the defendant a windfall to the expense of public security and the integrity of civil trials. Rather than excluding whatever evidence may be traced to an illegal search, the defendant should be permitted to obtain appropriate redress in civil law proceedings. More with the victim of an illegal search who is not there after charge with the crime should also be able to obtain appropriate redress. Indeed, it seems to me that the significance of the words the people in the Fourth Amendment is precisely that it protects all of us, <coughs> unlike the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, which are directed uh, just to the accused or to defendants. Um, now, a related concern I have with both the conventional account and appeals is that they read the Bill of Rights as largely designed to disable government. In particular, to disable the Congress and the President in his legislative capacity. In the conventional account, the legislative branch is disabled where it would trample on the rights of individuals or minorities. In ideals, it is disabled where it uh, would be self-interested or unrepresented. And both of these visions, I think, have much to commend them. But both of them fail to credit another important theme in the Bill of Rights. Much of the bill is not directed towards disabling or incapacitating Congress and the President. Rather, it's directed towards protecting every citizen from the arbitrary actions of bureaucrats, enforcers, law enforcement agents, and other autocratic administrators of federal law. Moreover, I think the Bill of Rights recognizes the important role that Congress and the President, in his legislative capacity, have to play in thus protecting the liberties of the people. Um, the Bill of Rights recognizes the special value of law. That word is repeated throughout the bill, too. Law in the very specific sense in which it's defined in the original Constitution. A bill passed by both houses not vetoed by the president or, or cheating override, a bill which is not ex post facto nor a bill of attainment. The due process clause of the Fifth Amendment is, of course, the greatest example of the Bill of Rights reliance on law, which means reliance on our representative Republican institutions. A law, a statute, may deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, but only a law not a government official acting outside or without the law. Less significantly, the Third Amendment recognized the importance of conscious deciding in advance the manner in which soldiers may be quartered during a time of war. 
The Sixth Amendment recognizes that Congress and the President shall decide in advance the legislative districts in which criminal trials will be held. And even the First Amendment, which along with the Seventh are the only uh, amendments specifically directed at confining Congress, even the First Amendment can be seen as enabling the legislative branch to do the bidding of the people. Um, as Akil's account does suggest, so he doesn't dwell on this, so I just want to stress it. A petition by the people might present the need for government protection to enhance the security of the people. <coughs> the people may petition the government for the purpose of government action, not simply to prevent it from acting. Now, James Madison, we all want to quote James Madison, he certainly recognized this third thing. The need to commit government to act with due regard for the desires of the people. Even as he recognized these other two things or importance of the Bill of Rights in terms of avoiding the danger of having overweening majorities and the danger of attenuated representation. As Madison said to Thomas Jefferson in his letter of October 1788 about the Bill of Rights, a letter which he quotes from, but not this. Um, this passage. It's been remarked that there is a tendency in all governments to an augmentation of power at the expense of liberty. But the remark is usually understood does not appear to be well founded. Power, when it has attained a certain degree of energy and independence, generally goes on to further degrees. But when below that degree, the direct tendency is to further degrees of relaxation. It is a melancholy reflection that liberty should be equally exposed to danger, whether the government has too much or too little power. The point I'm making here is that the Bill of Rights does not always seek to disable our public institutions is obviously related to my first point. The protection of individual rights may also be protection of the rights of majorities. When a law enforcement agent engages in an unreasonable search of your home, this is government attention. But it is often not the oppression of an unrepresentative or self interested Congress or President, as Akil's model would suggest. It's also often not the tyranny of a majority over an oppressed minority, as the conventional model would suggest. Rather, the problem is often a government agent quite unresponsive both to elected officials and to popular sentiment. <coughs> Let me take two minutes to express some reservations about Hill's reading of the petition in the First Amendment and the grand jury in the, uh, in the Fifth Amendment as great populist institutions. Um, again, I think there's more individual uh, and less populism than Akil may stress in the paper. Now, the image of grand jurors as populist protectors is somewhat confused. Akil has quoted James <coughs> and cited the grand jury presentments protesting the 1816 congressional pay raise as examples of the populist grand juries which favor those conditions. But this is not the grand jury that is enshrined in the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment secures a very different function for the grand jury. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise for this crime unless on a presentment or indictment of the grand jury. <clears throat> the difference between a presentment and an indictment was that an indictment was drawn up by a prosecutor, whereas a presentment was uh, presented by a grand jury on its own knowledge. The first amendment refers to a very specific type of presentment, an accusation of wrongdoing. Uh, nor do I think was the grand jury composed of the people, or even the citizens. Um, in, in many states, at least, the uh, Qualifications for grand jury were, were greater than those of uh, uh, head of juries or to exercise the franchise. It seems doubtful to me that the grand jury envisioned by the Fifth Amendment was ever ordained as a free popular voice on public affairs, much less the current law would countenance this species of political vigilantism. Um, in any event, it's not a function of the founders thought warning constitutional protection. Uh, petitions were not necessarily popular devices either. Let me just quote from you from a source which I got from Akil, which he cited. In the 1670s, certain Connecticut petitioners asked that roads be built for them to reach their meeting house on the Sabbath. 
This petition in turn was opposed by other petitioners who complained that the road construction would destroy their pasture lands. And note that these competing petitions did not involve a dispute between the people <coughs> and their agents, as a field account might suggest. I think they represented a dispute between competing interests of different people. And we may think of petitioning at the frame as having performed some of the same functions that lobbying does today. Um, the people, assuming there are people behind the lobbyists, rarely speak in a single voice, and Congress must decide which of the many conflicting voices it will keep to finally return to the words of the First Amendment. The redress of grievances sought by a First Amendment petition is not necessarily referred to a populist antagonism against the legislature. It refers also to antagonism among the people, antagonisms that the legislature, thanks to the framers, is there to resolve. The, we have evidence, excellent startling, 
suggesting that the judges try again and again to talk about it. Don't do that. Take your child. It's possible, by implication, what the judges were saying was, it's possible the jury may let you off, or it's possible the jury may employ some of the mitigating powers that they had to return uh, lesser offenses as the, as the jury. Now, in our own day, jury trial continues to occupy uh, a very central place uh, in the uh, formal law, the law of the books, and in the mythology of the law. The constitutions haven't changed, obviously, as the language I read. The federal constitution is mirrored in every state constitution and has been right away along from the conception of the community. These constitutions haven't changed. So the formal law is the same. And indeed, if you are to form a picture of our practice uh, from popular culture, uh, you would, uh, see, I think, not be alert to the proposition that very much has changed. Uh, you can turn on the TV and you get at almost any time a steady stream of dramas in which uh, some contest for the verdict of a jury uh, has been uh, conducted and then uh, uh, Perry Mason or whatever these new ones are, LA Law or whatever, I'm dating myself. Uh, uh, you know how it all works. <laughs> well, in truth, in truth, criminal jury trial has largely disappeared uh, in this country. It's simply a gone. Can you find it? Of course you can find it. Uh, but it isn't characteristic. Uh, can you find a hippopotamus in the Bronx? Yeah, there's one in the Bronx Zoo. <laughs> but it's got nothing to do with life in the Bronx. <laughs> it's a corner. And so is Sunny. So is criminal <laughs> jury trial. Uh, the criminal justice system now disposes of virtually all cases of serious crime. Uh, by plea, by plea bargaining, uh, or in a couple of jurisdictions in the state systems uh, by uh, uh, non-jury trial, and trial procedures, uh, one character just in mid-Atlantic states, kind of fascinating divergence from the national norm. But depending on the jurisdiction, uh, anything up to 99% of all felony convictions uh, are by plea, 99% above. And this non-trial procedure has become quite simply the ordinary dispositive procedure of America. Very long. That's how we do business. That's the reality. And it's not really pleasant to be out. Plea bargaining is a subversion of the formal law. It works by threat. We tell the accused, you want your right to jury trial? Be honest, yes. Take the right to jury trial that's in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution. Please go right there. <laughs> but if you claim it and are convicted, guess what we're going to do? We're going to punish you twice. Once for what you're convicted of, and once for having the temerity to exercise your right to jury trial. Yes. And that is how we exactly come out and say that, but that's what we convey, that's what we do by the sentence differential that we impose, whether the form of the plea bargain is charge bargaining <laughs> or the sentence bargaining, which is probably more relevant. How did criminal jury trial come to disappear? <laughs> There's some monographic work uh, that has been done on this. I've done some of it. Others have. Al Alshur is the one that worked on work this. And there's a lot more that needs to be known about it. But the basic story is fairly well understood. Criminal jury trials, the framers understood it as it was practiced on both sides of the Atlantic race in the, in the second half of the 18th century, was a summary proceeding. A dozen or more in a single day to a single single trial court, a dozen or more cases of full felony jury trial to go forward. The procedures were through. Lawyers were seldom involved. There was no four year of juries. The juries tended to be the same jury start to finish. There was almost no challenge practice. Uh, the juries, the jurors were experienced veterans who served again and again, therefore didn't need much instructing. There was almost no law of evidence. Because there were no lawyers, there were none of the lawyers' motions and manipulations that were characteristic of modern procedure. Because there was essentially no appeal for error, for Angus, the judge wrote out of town on the size, uh, 
there was a very limited health rights, and therefore all the motions that are associated with provoking error, protecting error, protecting the health review, all that stuff would not happen. This was not a dream in criminal justice. <laughs> the system that the framers contemplated uh, was, uh, and I think constitutional, right? <laughs> uh, was a lot rougher system than uh, anything that I think would find favor. I am not, in other words, uh, yearning for the good old days when we tried 15 felony jury trials a day in the old Bailey and comparable uh, places uh, on this side of the war. I think, uh, I think that there are real reasons why we have been led to uh, try to increase the level of safety. I think what actually happened was the capture of the criminal trial by lawyers, the lawyerization arrived, the adversary system, the silence of the abuse. I think we did our safeguards in ways that turned out to be uh, clumsy, turned out to be wrong, turned out to be so uh, costly in their uh, time demands and the like that uh, in the end we couldn't, we couldn't give our routine procedure to everybody to look in the The Europeans, who had had a much worse criminal justice system than we did for many centuries, uh, turned out not to have made that mistake. But the result that today you wind up with in a place like North Germany, you wind up in North Germany. In the German system, uh, what you have is a criminal justice system in which every case of serial, serious crime has a panel which includes uh, lay participants and full crime. Uh, we, on the other hand, having for very complicated serious historical reasons uh, come at it the way we've done, wind up with a system which says you are entitled to the most leisurely trial procedure the world has ever known with a level of safeguard that would boggle the mind, but Please don't ask for it. And if you do, boy, will be happy. If I can't, you know, in the back. I don't like the work, in case you haven't. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's generally not a good idea to have a constitution which is full of glorious. Uh, Illusory rights doesn't give you. I think there ought to be a rather close correspondence between the text of a fundamental document and what's in there. I think that's probably a pretty good principle of uh, good governance. I think that plea bargaining is dangerous because, in effect, it concentrates power in a low visibility decision maker, the prosecutor. Plea bargaining has, in effect, transferred to public prosecutors the powers of jurors and judges in our courts. That is to say, that the powers of adjudication and of sentencing are collapsed into the negotiating process, which is handled by the prosecutor house. I believe that plea bargaining is wrong and dangerous because it is essentially coercive. I think that a legal system that comes to depend upon coercing people out of their rights in order to have the thing be functional at all is, by definition, a failed system. I really mean by definition. The system can't work by honoring its own premises. Instead, it has to put people under ferocious pressure. And that pressure is real. And in some cases, not a lot, but in some cases, I think it really does lead to false witness. Plea bargaining and false verdicts. People who may be in effect false witness against You make a threat, but if the threat is 50 cent fine or death penalty, I don't care what I'm accused of. Of course I do. Now, we don't have that level of disparity, but we do have a high enough level of disparity in the system that a lot of people feel that they are coerced. <coughs> there are serious problems of appearances. The RNA conceals valuable information. There is a lingering distaste uh, in substantial sections of the community that something was wrong about the way James Earl Ray was sent off to prison in Tennessee, that he never got the trial. There is, in other words, a positive externality to criminal trials. Of disclosure of information. When it came time to plead for the Spiro Avenue, they learned that the Justice Department had as a special part of that deal the notion that they would spread on the public record the evidence that they assembled in order that that sense of doubt about what really happened uh, would not be. And of course, I think there are much more arguments about the nation of criminal sanctions that are offended. I don't think they're happy. I think they're happy. 
Any justification for plea bargaining? Let me tell you what the Supreme Court's holding is. It's San Dollar against New York 404 U.S. 1971 Chief Justice Berger. Listen to this. <laughs> plea bargaining needs to be encouraged because, quote, if every criminal charge was subjected to a full scale trial, common mistakes in the federal government would be multiplied by many times the number of judges in court and so Close quote. Translation We can't afford the vote. <laughs> Sheer experience. The only halfway serious academic justification I've ever seen for an size halfway. Uh, is the article by Frank Easterbrook uh, in uh, Volume 12 of Journal Legal Studies, uh, which says, well, look, it works like a market, uh, and lots of uh, uh, individual utiles will be taken advantage of, uh, taken account of there as we process the things through the system. Uh, the uh, uh, people are behaving very rationally when and how they waive their rights. And that's all true. Uh, uh, it is indeed uh, a quite glorious Turkish rug market that we created uh, in the world of public frames uh, It does indeed look a lot like a market, but I have to a uh, market proponent though I am, but that's a curse uh, and not an achievement uh, when you're talking about what the functions of the judiciary in the public interest in the criminal process uh, really are. Uh, in other words, I think Frank's marvelous paper happens to assume the most important question in issue, which is what is the purpose of the jury trial guarantee? Was it meant to be sold at the Turkish market? <laughs> the other rugs have the answer is not. I am left to say that I think that we need to give a great deal more attention to how we handle uh, criminal adjudication that we do. I believe non trial concessionary procedure is wrong. I don't think we can ever, on the other hand, give that which we today promise, which is full scale adversary criminal procedure. The framers constitutionalized and contemplated non adversary summary jury trial. That's gone. We can't bring it back. Uh, I think that we're likely to wind up. With paying attention to trying to return elements of real adjudication into probably the Rule 11 hearing or some such some such thing, that is to say, into the procedures that we now use to ventilate the plea for voluntariness and adequate factual basis. And I even hope that we might learn from the Europeans who came to look at us about a century ago and took back with them the notion that lay participation in criminal adjudication is profoundly important, A, but B, you can't do it the way the Americans do it. We prove them right. We don't do it either. The result is they have more of our system than we do because they use lay, lay persons in adjudication in a way that works, whereas we have a system of adversary adjudicatory trial which is so complicated that we can't give it to anybody, and therefore we're left to live the line of the repeal right to criminal jury. Confederation, which was predicated on the sovereignty of the people of each state. 
So I'm in a somewhat awkward position of really saying two things. Um, that I believe in um, national uh, popular uh, majoritarianism and popular sovereignty. And it's true that the, the Bill of Rights was promoted by a lot of anti federalists but they're using the word people that was there in the original Constitution before, so the preamble. Um, and um, they don't say peoples in the 10th Amendment. They say people. They talk about respect the states, plural, respectively, but they don't say the peoples respectively. And I think as a textualist that that matters and, and, and there are other things. Um, but, but what's interesting about the important about the invocation of secession is this dominant uh, deep theme of, of sort of popular sovereignty and majoritarianism that uh, whatever you think about secession continues to exist at the state constitutional level, the state constitution being amended um, by uh, simple popular majorities in secession in the conventions. Um, Second thing is about Madison, as Francis has not uh, mentioned. And uh, I think he's absolutely right that um, Madison's vision was different from the Bill of Rights as it came out. And I, I should have uh, probably flagged that a little bit more. Um, uh, Madison wanted the original Bill of Rights to apply against the states, precisely because this is the author of Federalist Number 10 who thinks the states are a big part of the problem. He, he loses um, on, on that. Um, Madison is less of a majoritarian than many of the other uh, 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 important folks. James Wilson, for example, is much more of a populist and majoritarian in my mind uh, than Madison. But uh, one, one minor caveat, if we, uh, uh, if we instead of looking at Madison and the Philadelphia Convention, not as great a majoritarian, not a big believer, as a big believer in the state's rights, uh, but we instead sort of look at what Madison's going to become very soon, uh, the Alien Sedition Act controversy is going to be a defender of a certain kind of federalism, uh, the ability of state legislatures to challenge the federal government, and a national majoritarianism. Uh, it's basically a, a national electorate who kind of adjudicates the constitutionality of the Alien Sedition Act in the, in the election of 1800. And even before uh, that, you start to see Madison taking state rights a little bit more seriously than he did in Philadelphia in opposing the constitutionality of the first bank, for example. So Madison is a very interesting <laughs> case study. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for Professor Bruce for reminding us of Madison's thought. Um, uh, Professor Stiff, uh, I actually should say, hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we made a, a lot of great points. Um, let me just pick up on two quick things. Uh, one, I agree with her that it's a mistake, it's an oversimplification to say that the core, that the only rights here are uh, majoritarian or, or collective. Um, I think, I'm, I think to the extent that I, um, I said that I misspoke, uh, what I do want to do, however, is remind us of the tradition that I think the conventional accounts of just basically uh, made all the invisible. The petition clause is a good example. Of course, individuals can petition, and of course, sometimes petitions will present conflicting um, individual interests. Um, but a lot of times, um, uh, we, we miss the, the important um, uh, uh, a role of petitions when it's a majority of citizens complaining about unrepresentative government life. For example, when Congress, for the first time since 1789 and 1816, votes a self-made increase, and boy, there are lots of petitions on that, um, and an obvious petition. So, absolutely right about it. Um, second, a very briefly on the word people in the Fourth Amendment. Um, I think Kate is absolutely right that um, Tony Amsterdam takes this phrase and tries to make arguments about the exclusionary rule and collective rights. I want to disassociate myself uh, from, from that in two ways. Um, one, I don't think actually in the Fourth Amendment the people, that phrase, is as strong as elsewhere, uh, precisely because it's modified by the word person, which is much more individualistic, um, two separate times in the rest of the world. I, I emphasize people, I think, a little bit more in, in earlier drafts, and um, two of the panelists um, were going to be here this afternoon, uh, Owen Fiss and, and Gary Lawson, talked me out of that, and I am very thankful uh, to them for that. And you should, you should stick around with that and, and hear their comments on, on all sorts of other things as well. Um, I'm not a big fan of the exclusionary rule either, um, and the reason um, is illustrative of the main thing. Well, but what judges have done is they've taken the Fourth Amendment They've made it the process of judges to enforce in an exclusionary rule context, focusing on, 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 the, on, on, on the criminal context. 
Um, the old way you litigated the Fourth Amendment was the government official broke into your house, you sued him for trespass and damages, and the jury rather than the judge decided. And you know why we don't do that today? Because judges created a thing called good faith um, immunities, not from the exclusionary rule, but from damage actions, even when government officials are acting unconstitutionally, they are personally immune from damages in a way that they never were at common law and never were even in as late as 1925. Um, and so this is an interesting story about a shift away from juries as protectors of a Bill of Rights um, uh, values and towards judges. Um, and so uh, I'm glad the case was brought up. Final thing um, on, uh, about John uh, Langbein's uh, presentation. No how um, we've shifted ever so subtly from a perspective of about jury trial, about popular participation, democratic self-governance. We have juries because these are people's representatives in the judiciary, just like the people's representatives in the legislature. And it's about really their interests and their rights. To a more defendant-oriented perspective, it's unfair for the defendant to get hammered in these uh, tape arguing kind of ways. I think that's reflected, interestingly, um, in one key move that Professor Langbein makes. He says, well, you know, the text says, in Article 3, and I agree with him, the trial of all crimes shall be uh, by jury, dot, 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 by jury. But then he actually introduces a little word. He says, well, I mean, serious crimes. Um, I'm not so sure it means serious crimes. Um, I uh, mean, except serious crimes uh, in, uh, in England or in states which had differently worded constitutions. But there's a nice piece in um, the Chicago Law Review called The Petty Offenders, I uh, Have No Peers, that critiques the idea that there's even a petty crime exception uh, to jury trial. People laugh also believe there was no petty crime exception to jury trial. Why, why did Professor Langbein um, maybe suggest that there was after sort of hammering so hard on the text? Well, if you adopt more of an individual rights defendant oriented perspective to jury trial, in a way where it's a serious offense, the, the defendant has more to lose, and so you, there's more of an interest in jury trial um, than where there's a petty offense. But if you focus instead on sort of the jury as being about democratic participation, maybe there's a, as much of a, a value there even in, 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 in petty offenses. Um, I don't want to push the point too hard uh, because um, maybe you don't want to push too hard. <laughs> I mean, clearly, his, the defendant's interest is key here because there's not a similar mandate on the civil side. So where you don't have an individual defendant subject to the extraordinary coercive power of government, where you have individual versus individual, like in case petition phase, uh, jury trial may be waivable by the parties in a way that wasn't true in the criminal context. So, so to, I think that, that reminds us, and here I'll close, with, with case uh, uh, big point that um, that there, there, there are individual rights aspects to these things as well. All I want to do is prevent us from, from thinking that that's all that's going on, that there are all these other things that, that are going on, and I think we've lost a lot of them. Let me start uh, kind of as you put the point in talking a lot of this. Any other panelists have anything to add? Those are the good questions from the audience. Uh, yes, sir, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Please stand and I'm um, <laughs> just wondering, a little louder, please. I was wondering if you thought that the lack of jury trials is an indication of the disenfranchisement of the American people that they feel like the government as a result of the bureaucratic elite. That has developed in a lot of government in the legislature as a result of 90% of the return rate or the growth of administrative regulation. Repeat the question. Well, he tossed me a fireball, and I'm not going to hit it. He uh, yeah, wonders whether there's a connection between the interest of jury trials and uh, a larger sense of dissatisfaction and suspicion of uh, the uh, ruling uh, authorities. Uh, um, I need a wiser, I need wiser, uh, and, uh, more broad gauge uh, uh, intellects uh, to make those connections than I. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think this was probably uh, just historically a legal technical development, uh, in a push and counter push. Uh, as we developed uh, much higher crime rates, we developed a uh, lawyerization of the trial. Uh, as we, uh, the, uh, the fresh 
pressures, the peace of pressures mounted uh, sometime in the second half of the 19th century, we began to get serious levels of non trial This is the case of serious crime. Uh, and those, uh, those moves uh, were worked out already by the year 1920s. Uh, Raymond Moley, in a famous article in volume two, I think, of the Southern California Law Review, uh, pointed out that we were down to uh, only 20% jury trial rates uh, that early. Uh, so uh, this has been a long development. Uh, Frank Eastbrook and I were talking out uh, the hallway earlier, and Frank uh, made a point, uh, which is uh, absolutely correct, that this had been a night and day change if the framers had. Uh, ordered a jury trial, a uh, criminal jury trial, uh, on day one and on day two, uh, we had uh, moved to the system we've had today. I mean, there's been a revolution, couldn't have it. This was a slow, interstitial change in which a bunch of different things happened, and nobody saw the whole picture, and yet there was no, no going back uh, uh, on the end. Uh, Keel, uh, while I got the microphone, since I'm not going to get back, uh, let me say that the main reason that the uh, framers uh, said that all uh, uh, criminal cases is. Uh, they were not uh, planning on having the federal uh, courts uh, be small claims courts. Uh, uh, we have trivialized the federal courts. We vastly expanded the scope of federal jurisdiction, both civil and criminal matters. Uh, but they thought that the, uh, almost all federal criminal business, uh, sorry, almost all criminal business in this country was going to be a state business and that the federal business was going to be a handful of uh, very serious offenses, either sedition or some revenue offenses, with the excise and so forth. But they were not looking for a big box office, large volume uh, federal criminal jurisdiction. Therefore, uh, and you'll pick this up in the Frankfurt and Corporate article in our report, uh, there's plenty, there's plenty of reason for thinking that uh, uh, it makes complete sense to read out of. Uh, uh, they were starting to apply into the, the criminal trial guarantee the notion that it was a serious <laughs> trial. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for the last half of what happened. Uh, but there's a lot of Supreme Court law on that. I would say it's better than the Supreme Court plea bargaining law. Okay. I have to say something about plea bargaining here. I don't know why I'm getting involved in this, but I'm sitting right next to him with this. Thank you. Speaking of half full of half empty. I didn't sell the right to jury trial for very much. That was it's the right to trial. We keep saying jury trial, but we're really talking about trial. Uh, if you as a defendant say, look at I'll, I'll waive a jury, you know what, you get three months off. It should wait trial. And often you should understand that's the way it works. The defendant, his lawyer, comes in and, and makes this offer. I agree it's selling. I agree with a lot of the points that John made. But let's understand this. Why can the defendant sell these rights? Because we've given them to them. We have, and these are valuable rights from the government's perspective. The right to a law, you know, if you look at New York State, the right to a broad year of two weeks. And, and, and of course, John recognizes uh, some of this stuff. But the, the reason that the defendant may be able to go from you know, uh, five years if he's convicted of trial to uh, nine months if he pleads is because his constitutional rights, which he is trading in for less time in jail, his constitutional rights are worth that much. I dare say that at the time uh, the Constitution was founded, was a frame, the procedural trial rights of defendants were not nearly so great, and therefore couldn't be sold for that much. I do not intend this to be uh, a justification for plea bargaining, but rather to understand, uh, as I think you did allude to, that, that plea bargaining as we know it couldn't have happened without the great growth in procedural uh, trial rights of the defendant. And as long as we allow those rights to be alienable, as long as we allow him to sell he will have it. He will do so. I see a member of the least public branch of government. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to regain the other half of my intellectual respectability. Because John was supposed to give me only half. Uh, I, I won't comment on Akil's paper because I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm pleading that he and I will engage in a market transaction by which I'll be able to acquire it. <laughs> but with respect to John, the, the critical question for plea bargaining and whether there is some constitutional problem has always been one of benchmarking, I have thought. If you assume with Kate Stiff that what is going on is that a reasonable sentence 
an appropriate sentence will be fixed after trial, and the defendant is getting a favor for selling his constitutional rights, then you don't have any problem with plea bargaining. If you assume, on the other hand, with John Langbein, that the just sentence is being fixed after the plea bargain, and that what happens after the trial is a barbarous sentence, then you have a great deal of trouble with plea bargaining. And the difficulty is figuring out which of these states of the world holds. Now, we have in civil cases a much higher percentage of settlements than we do in criminal cases. A smaller percentage of civil cases goes to trial than criminal, although when you look in the Seventh Amendment, there's a right to jury trial for all cases worth more than $20. And John Langbein's not terribly worried about the settlement of civil cases because he is confident that if a civil case goes to trial, the judge, the jury, or the judge will figure out at the end of the trial what the actual damages are based on some objective method for creating damages. John will, of course, object to punitive damages, but even throwing punitive damages out, there is that method. And if the plaintiff settles for less than that, then that's a mutually agreeable deal. No one thinks of that as a penalty for standing on trial. John is not nearly so sanguine about that for the criminal process. And the thing that is missing in an exchange between Kate and John, or between John and me, is this benchmarking method. Now, I should have thought that John would change his view now that we have the sentencing guidelines, which define appropriate sentences. But he won't, because he will say, and there'll be no way to refute it, that everything in the sentencing guidelines has been jacked up to make it possible to engage in this transaction. It turns out to be no really satisfactory way of resolving it, but I hope it ought to be clear that that's where the core of, of any debate ought to lie. Once you have one of these conceptions or the other about what's happening, almost everything else falls out very quickly.
Yeah, sure. uh, just like that, Professor Amar, I think you've done a very good uh, textual analysis of the Bill of Rights, but it seems to fly in the face of the political and intellectual history of the period. Um, specifically, uh, before the federal constitution, there was a revolutionary constitution in Pennsylvania which provided for unicameral uh, legislature and a wide franchise. It seems to me, given the choice between being able to participate on a daily basis or more regularly voting for uh, my representatives and the chance every now and then to call a con vote in a convention to change the government, then perhaps the Pennsylvania Constitution was perhaps more inclusive and more democratic. Second, uh, if you look at some of the things the framers themselves um, said, uh, uh, Professor Burns has mentioned Madison, but uh, Jefferson, for example, was the greatest, one of the greatest defenders of the Bill of Rights, had a very hierarchical view of education in which there would be public, public education at a level for sixth grade for some people and continuing on. So that, and in fact, when he wrote back from Paris, uh, was so afraid of the urban canai, as he called it, that uh, that, he, that that was the belief that uh, permeated his ideology of the the only farmer. So it seems to me that these people were really, uh, their intellectual heritage were really the gentry in England uh, in 1689 who wrote that Bill of Rights, unless perhaps there was some method of false consciousness involved, uh, the idea of inclusion uh, as something that's well, one of their views. Um, I'm going to try you're absolutely right that um, there are lots and lots of uh, constitutions, uh, Pennsylvania State Constitution of uh, 1776, various um, uh, uh, ancient mo uh, models that, uh, that the framers had before them, that as a matter of ordinary day-to-day -day government seem to bring the people into government, not uh, much more regularly into the legislature. And Professor Burns uh, rightly that invokes uh, Madison's number 63, and says that's not the model of the federal constitution. And if you look at Article 1, the law, if you look at Article 3, you see a pretty elitist institution. Uh, uh, you see Frank Easterbrook. Um, if you look at um, Article 1 and 2, you know, with life tenure and all the rest. Um, if you look at Articles uh, 1 and 2, you see again the people somewhat that distance uh, from uh, ordinary day to day. Uh, uh, Legislative action. I do think if you look at Article 7, which is the constitutive founding act, you see a profoundly participatory and democratic and majoritarian um, uh, 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 provision when it came to making the Constitution the supreme law of the land. And my argument is there's a similar democratic um, uh, right um, to alter or amend anything in it, including uh, Article 3 and Frank's tenure, including uh, one and two. Um, so uh, now, but how are the people going to be able really to really exercise any sort of real popular sovereignty if they're so totally excluded from day to day governance? That's the thrust of your question. That's where, for me, the jury becomes so central, not from the defendant's perspective, but as a way of bringing ordinary citizens day to day into government to, to uh, get them to exercise uh, those muscles of deliberation and, and participation that are essential for a, a system uh, of, by, and for the people to be meaningful. And your final point was the invocation of public education. Tocqueville defines the jury as, quote, it, a gratuitous public school ever open to teach citizens about the rights of students. And John hates this stuff, but it is the dominant tradition. It's Francis Lieber in, in 1850. Um, <laughs> So is the church a mechanism for democratic education? Churches, of course, are, are running schools of those days, and that's why it's important to protect churches for, for democratic education. And, um, and, and, and believe it or not, malicious play this role as well. And if you want to take seriously popular sovereignty today, I do think we need to take seriously the idea of education, and that connects back with some of the things that I think Bob Ellison um, was uh, very thoughtfully expounding yesterday. I think we've got a fighting war with that. <laughs> the uh, the idea that I like it, that we're running this criminal justice system 
uh, with these jurors in order to give them a little bit of free tuition uh, seems to me to be fantastic. Yes, one of the things you can say to excuse yourself from interfering with their personal lives is that they get a look at how the government works and isn't that nice. But that is not the purpose of the experience with the jury, you get locked up in some filthy room, and sit around, and then you usually like, I mean, never mind. Uh, yeah. But the purpose of the thing was well understood, and the literature vastly more voluminous than some occasional Frenchman or German Frenchman. was thought to be damn dangerous. <laughs> and it was thought to be too dangerous to be in the hands of hirelings of the state, even when they're nice and they smile like they said they're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and what you're supposed to do about it is to diffuse power. And fascinatingly, even the Europeans, who in general have resisted our preoccupation with separation of powers as a way of dealing with the dangers of government power, and I think largely wisely, I'm not a big believer in separation of powers. Even they, right there, said there's one place where our approach, which is in general, get a better bureaucracy and control it, control the heck out of it, rather than worry about the separation of powers. And that tends to be my view of things. I'm not a big fan of a lot of what our friend did here. But I do have to say, I do have to say that the one thing where the Europeans agreed with James Madison and came over and took it back on the boat was the criminal justice system. It's low level, it's low visibility, it's out of the way, it's darn dangerous, it's very uncomfortable. What can happen to you in the criminal process? And it is too dangerous to entrust to ordinary bureaucrats without late participation when you deal with serious crime. It's not a schoolhouse, it's serious. <laughs> Amendment. 
Um, of course, I know you were referring to the takings clause, um, but that's not the entire Fifth Amendment. And then one interesting question becomes, uh, why is the takings clause there with the rest of the Fifth Amendment? It's a question that typically doesn't get asked because we focus on everything in such a clause-bound way. Um, and takings is taught in property, and um, the Fourth Amendment is taught in criminal procedure, and, and, and what have you. Interestingly, the takings clause was the only provision of the Bill of Rights that was not proposed by any state ratifying conventions. Madison believed in a lot, and I think this is very good evidence for Professor Burns' thesis that Madison's view was a little different from my overall sense of, of the original Bill of Rights. Madison slips this one in, I uh, argue, along with a bunch of analytically unrelated provisions, uh, in part because the dominant view um, of his contemporaries is somewhat different from uh, his, his own view. Uh, and uh, now on the more general question about the contract thought, which is of course uh, not in the original Bill of Rights, but the original Constitution and property generally, um, on the contract thought, I'm very much with um, my classmate Mike Rappaport, who is a member of this society, um, who has written a very thoughtful uh, piece about how the contract clause is structural in its nature and it's in part about uh, the legislative generality and prospectivity, just like the Bill of Attainer and the Takings Clause. It's a note from 93. Uh, you know, general. Um, uh, and so I see it as actually more structural, less about, it doesn't say, uh, as Richard Epstein would like to say, freedom of contract, uh, for good reasons. Um, but you're absolutely right that there is this sort of central importance of property and protecting people, um, giving them literally a, a place to stand, a ground to stand on against that government tyranny. Um, I think that connects up with the, uh, some of the ideas of affirmative rights that Bob Ellison uh, was trying to uh, uh, invoke uh, yesterday. Um, today, what it may mean to have the kind of independence to be a citizen stand against government might not be to have 48 years in a mule, but to have some kind of voucher or other entitlements to education. Um, uh, but, here's a big but, I do not believe that government redistribution um, is an illegitimate purpose, at least after the adoption of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which is not just about income taxation, but about predictably progressive, that is, redistributive income taxation. Um, there may be limits to the degree to which government can uh, redistribute, um, but in, in this context, whatever the original understanding of distribution is, when you try to connect the dots between the takings clause and the contracts clause, and it goes back to the tainter clauses, and other things, as Professor Epstein uh, nicely does, you have to update the story today and look similarly at the vision behind the, the 16th Amendment, which I do think um, is more um, redistributed. But I believe in the idea of property rights. I believe in so much that I think everyone should have some property. I think it's such a good thing. And that's what 40 acres of New York is all about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.